I will give you two titles today, one that will be probably on the tape that you will get after today's sermon, and that topic is the price of true leadership restoration. The price of true leadership restoration. But I want to give you a subtitle. It's a little unique one. I'm really going to speak today on the silence of the Lamb. Sounds familiar to some of you. The silence of the Lamb. Write that down, please. This subtitle is taken really from an experience that I had two years ago. A couple of years ago, the world's famous Academy Awards for film and Hollywood accomplishments was being celebrated in Hollywood. It was all over the world being watched by over 1.8 or 9 billion people were tuned in that night. One of the historic films accomplishments that year was a film that won almost all of the Oscars. One film almost won all of them. This film won the best film of the year award. It won the best actors and best supporting actress. It won the best director and the best screenplay. It won a long list of awards for this one film. And many of the accolades that this film accomplished was so amazing that that film the following day was in all the major newspapers and Time Magazine and Newsweek, everybody carried the story of this film. They said that after that Academy Awards, the flocking of people to watch the film tripled in two weeks. It made multi-millions of dollars. The name of the film was The Silence of the Lambs. And there's a plural there. It was a, a film about a man who was put in prison. He was a serial killer. Very tragic film. But yet the world marveled and plastered accolades of recognition on that film. The Silence of the Lambs. As I watched the Oscar that night, my mind went back as I watched the many stars cross the stage and pick up their Oscars, my, my mind went back on another drama that took place on a stage. Uh, the stage was a cross. And I want to say that the person who was the star in that particular drama was not acting. There was no support actors. There was no screenplay. No one had to write how this thing was to be done. There was no director or lighting professionals. There was, there was nobody there to even be a supporting actor to him. This was not an act. The name of this drama was The Silence of the Lamb. The Sermon of Silence that Jesus preached during his last hours on this earth was the most powerful message of his entire ministry. Hundreds of thousands of sermons have been preached over the years on the last seven words of Jesus. Some of you have preached them yourself or sat in services where some minister have preached on the seven last words of Jesus. I want to list them for you. You can write them down if you can write that fast. These have been preached probably more than any other statements in the world for 2,000 years. The first statement, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani. Second, I thirst. Third, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Fourth, today you will be with me in paradise. Fifth, 
Son, behold thy mother. Mother, behold your son. Sixth, it is finished. And the seventh statement, into your hands I commit my spirit. These were all the words that he spoke while on the cross. Now, I want to give you a little exam. If you would slowly repeat all of these words all together, you will find that they barely fill out one minute of conversation. Seven one-liners spoken by Jesus as his last conversation on earth before the cross. The length of time that Jesus hung on the cross, write this down, was six hours. 360 minutes he hung on the cross. Six hours. The question then is, if what he said equals less than one minute, then what was Jesus saying during the rest of those five hours and 59 minutes? What a question. What would you have said if that was you on the cross? Let's think about you. You being condemned unjustly. All you ever did was try to help people and save people and heal people and feed thousands of people fish and bread. All you've ever done was to lift up the poor. Imagine dying without justice between two felons. What would you say for six hours? I know what I would say. I would give them a piece of my mind. I would cuss those soldiers out. I would spell out every single injustice that they have ever done to me for the last five days of trial. I would have spewed out judgment on them being the son of God. I would have told them about their future in hell. I would have told them how God was going to punish them for killing such an honest, decent person. And yet, the lamb was silent. First Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. End quote. When he was taunted, he remained silent. When he was bruised and pierced, his words of forgiveness flowed out as quickly as his blood. When he was bruised and blows were hit upon his body, the bruise and the blows were meant with silent mercy. I want you to turn to Isaiah and let's find out what he was saying on the cross for five hours and 59 minutes when he said nothing. Isaiah tells us what he was saying. The silence of the lamb. This is probably one of the most important passages in the Bible. Why? Because it is the screenplay of the drama. The screenplay is what they write before the movie is made and it details exactly what would happen in the movie. Well, <laughs> almost 3,000 years before the drama would be played, the screenplay was written by Isaiah. Talk about details. Let's read from verse, six, verse 13 of Isaiah 52. See, my servant, he will act wisely. He will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. That's talking about the cross. He will be lifted up, it says. It's a screenplay. 
3,000 years before it happened. It tells you how it will happen. He will be lifted up. Isn't it amazing that when he came to earth, he told them a little bit about the screenplay. He says, the Son of Man will be lifted up and all men will be drawn unto him because he'll be lifted up. Look at verse 14. Just as there, was many, there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form was marred beyond human likeness. Talk about details. Isaiah said when they finished beating him, spitting on him, tearing his flesh out with that Roman whip, with bones in every piece of leather, and raked the skin of his back, when they finished pressing the thorns into his skull, and when they starved him for two days, and when they cussed him and beat him with clubs, they won't be able to recognize him. Isaiah said, that's a part of the screenplay. You'll be appalled when you see his body. But look at the next statement, verse 15. So will he sprinkle many nations. Hallelujah. Every time the whip went in his back, the blood sprayed. And the Bible said it sprayed on who? The nations. This is the difference between Jesus and Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or Baha'i Lullah or Hare Krishna. This is the difference between Jesus and all the others that claim to have the completion of God's salvation. It says his blood... When it is spilled, it will sprinkle the nations. That's important for the Jew to hear because the Jews believed that the Messiah only came for them. But it says his blood will sprinkle who? The nations. Sixth. This is the awesome miracle. But look at the next statement. And kings will shut their mouths because of him. Underline this verse right here. For what they were not told, they will see. That's the trick. That's the message right there. And what they have not heard, in other words, they're going to they're gonna understand some things they're not hearing. Look at that statement. What they have not, un have not heard, they will understand. That's a powerful statement. It is saying that when the blood is spilled, some things will be going on. Number one, <laughs> what they have not been told, they will see. In other words, there'll be a message in his silence. And what they have not heard, they will understand. There'll be a revelation in his silence. Jesus said more in his silence than in all of his preaching. Look at verse 1, chapter 53. Who has believed our report? Unto whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow, he was familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrow. Yet we considered him stricken by God. Smitten by him and afflicted. And please underline that. I think many people blame the Romans, but it wasn't the Romans. It was God that smite the sun. The instrument was simply being orchestrated, but it says God had to smite him. Why? Because the demand for salvation was dead. And God decided to pay it. And God was not smiting him as something new. He was already dead. God was just manifesting the death because before the foundation of the world, he was already slain. Also it says in verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was not a martyr. Don't let anyone tell you that Jesus was just a good man. 
who happened to die for a cause that he believed in. No, it says he was pierced for our sins and he was bruised for our what? Iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. Verse 6. Now we get it. We're talking about this silent lamb again. And we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him. What? I can't hear you. The iniquity of us all. Young people, Jesus died for your sins. So don't you think about going to Hare Krishna. When you go to college, don't let the teachers or professors talk you into believing in Scientology. It says, he died for your iniquities. There's no other leader in history who died for your sins. No one else bore your burdens. That's why I am so disappointed in so many Bahamian young people following Haley Selassie. This man has not taken your iniquity. He did not die for your sin. This is not about a lineage of Solomon. This is about sin we're talking about. We're not talking about who was related to David. David didn't die for your sin. So don't get hooked up on David who was related to David. I don't care who Haley Selassie was related to. He didn't take care of your iniquities. Look at this statement. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, but yet he did not open his mouth. The silence of the lamb. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers, he is what? Say it loud. I can't hear you. He was silent. Write it down. The silence of the lamb. When he was doing all of this, it was the most important work he ever did, and he was silent. He did not open his mouth. The Bible says in verse 7 of chapter 53, he was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. It goes on to say he was silent. In verse 52, reminder, go back to that a moment. The question is, what does it mean and why does God emphasize that he was silent? It is explained in verse 52. Come on, think with this with me now. Think with this with me. It says, for what they were not told, verse 15, verse 52, chapter 52, they will see. God's explaining the silence. And what they did not hear they will understand. In other words, for three and a half years he was talking, but they couldn't understand. And for three and a half years he was preaching, and they could not hear. But it says when the blood starts being sprinkled, and when the pressure gets on, it says they will hear even though he didn't speak. And they'll finally understand even though they didn't see a word out of his mouth. The silence of the Lamb will be louder than the preaching of the Lamb. I want you to get a revelation today. The quietest day in the life of Jesus was Good Friday. And yet, according to God, it was the day when he was preaching the loudest. More was said on Good Friday than three and a half years of ministry. It was the most powerful message and it was a silent message. Christ said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ said that he was the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep. Christ said that he will lay his life down. And for many. He said, he said, but on Good Friday, he didn't have to say anything. Do you get the message? A lot of people talk, but the rubber meets the road when it's time to test what you said. Good Friday was everything he preached in silence. The lamb said more in his silence than in his noise. 
Jesus for five hours and 59 minutes of agony said nothing for five hours only seven statements no longer than 59 minutes long 59 seconds long I mean he's dying for the world he's making his point and yet he only speaks for 60 seconds Jesus was doing more than dying he was communicating in red ink timeless secrets of the kingdom his disposition of silence became trust defined he was openly showing his followers how to embrace the cross that awaited each of them I hope you hear this message he was showing his disciples who would follow him how to handle the cross that each one of them would face I'm talking to you too many of us think that Good Friday is exclusively for Jesus I've come with a message for the 21st century and that is we got to get back to the true revelation and must remember that the cross was a regular topic between Jesus and his disciples it was not just his cross that he taught he established the cross as the measure of true discipleship let us turn to the book of Matthew chapter 10 take a deep breath before you read this because this is where Good Friday becomes your Friday the acid test of discipleship is not how well you can preach <laughs> the acid test of discipleship is not how often you can attend church meetings and carry a Bible the acid test test of a disciple is not how well you can memorize scripture let's read what Jesus says verse 37 anyone everybody say anyone say it loud anyone. louder anyone. come on louder I want you to shout it. Anyone. Come on, church, shout it loud. Anyone. That's the reason why I want you to say it. Because the anyone, he's including you. So what he's about to say is not for the early church. Anyone means anyone who claims to be my disciple. Look at it. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me and anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me verse 38 underline it and anyone everybody say anyone <laughs> say it loud anyone. you know that hit me two weeks ago he said I'm talking to you miles anyone anyone who does not take his cross now wait a minute Good Friday we focus on his cross but he says I want to talk about your cross some of you think that the cross was for me no he got a different one for you but he's showing you how to handle yours by the way he handled his y'all stay with me today every believer has a cross oh we love the resurrection we love Easter Sunday but I got news for you today you got a cross before you have a resurrection anyone who does not take his cross and what follow me he didn't die yet he's saying look I want you all to stay close I want you to watch how I handle the cross y'all better hear me I know the guys liked it when I rode in on the donkey and there were thousands of people Hosanna they liked it when the folks were flocking me by the thousand he said but that ain't the test y'all better hear me the test is not when everybody's after you and cheering and clapping he said the test is when you're by yourself the test is when the pressure is on and you feel like cussing uh oh and you feel like giving them peace of your mind he said follow me follow me shut up 
Woo! He says, you don't understand leadership. He said, come on, follow me. You want to be a leader? I want you to follow how I handle the cross. Follow me. If you, anyone, wants to follow me, he must pick up his cross, or he is not worthy of me. Good Friday was for you, not just for your salvation, but it was a demonstration for you to emulate and to follow on how to handle your crosses. Verse 39, he's going to explain what crosses are. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I want to give you a revelation. He's saying, look, crosses have to do with losing your life. That means going after your own ambitions, following your own plans in life, pursuing what the community says is good or what society says is good. He says, die to the pursuit of the world. Die to what the world says is success. In other words, abandon the pressure of the world to conform you and then lose your life for what? My sake. That means find out what I gave you birth for. Oh, I'm going to get to get something in a minute. He says, he says, your career is not the cross. Uh, help me, Lord. He says, what you studied for in college, that's not your cross. When you find out my purpose for your life and then abandon all those other things, there's going to be a whole lot of cross coming on you. Because you got to go against the grain and fight against people who don't understand. you got to go against pressure when you start pursuing your purpose. He said, but that's going to be the test of your discipleship. Fulfilling God's will silently. One of the greatest temptations of a disciple is to rebut. One of the greatest temptations of a disciple is to answer their critics. To defend their position. I might come in home a little bit. I mean, aren't we all tempted? We could try to want to explain why we believe what we believe. He said, just shut up and keep on believing it. No matter what they say, keep doing what I told you to do. No matter how they laugh, keep doing what I told you to do. No matter how they spit on you, keep doing what I told you to do. That's how you handle a cross. Why? Because when it's all over, you will be resurrected. Oh, glory. You're coming out of this thing. You're going to show who you are. The test of the true nature of Jesus was not his ministry on earth. The test of the true nature of Jesus is given out in a few words by Jesus the same week before he died. It's found in John 17 and 18. He says, Father, the hour has come. Hey, boy, say hour. He said, the hour has come to glorify the Son. Glorify means to reveal my true nature. He says, I'm going to the cross. The real you don't show up until pressure arrives. It's what you do under pressure that shows God who you really are and shows the world who... <laughs> See, Calvary was a setup for resurrection morning. He said, my shining owl, gentlemen, is the cross. It's not walking on the water. It's not multiplying fish and bread. It's not cursing a tree. It's not uh, casting out demons. He says, my shining moment, the acid test of my true leadership is, what do I do when the cross comes? And then he says, anyone. Everybody say, anyone. anyone. Say it loud. Anyone. Everybody say, I'm one. Anyone who decides to follow me must Take up his 
cross or he cannot be my disciple you want to be disciple of Jesus don't just hang around resurrection spirit get used to being killed Oh, I'm having so much fun because I understand the Holy Ghost is saying to you, brother, you're going to be successful. Get ready for cross. I was reading the words again that we heard this morning about what was said while he was on the cross. Did you hear what was said? People, friends, uh, people who were close to him were saying things like, why doesn't he come down? He always bragged about being the Christ. Now, there are a lot of people who want you to come out of your test. Help me, Lord. You're going through some tough times, and God is saying, hang in there. Some folks say, child, forget that religion thing, child. God says, no, stay on the cross. Come on, say it with me. Stay on your cross. Tell your neighbor, stay on your cross and shut up. Come on, tell him, and shut up. Stop complaining. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, talk to me. On the cross, you feel like complaining, and most of your complaint is against God. When you don't know what to do, just keep quiet. If you feel like cussing God, just keep quiet. You feel like cussing someone, keep quiet. You feel like cussing the enemy, just keep quiet. Why? That's the way you handle a cross. You show the crucifixion team that they are not bigger than you oh y'all don't understand me whoever has been appointed to crucify you this week is under orders <laughs> Woo! glory and believe me friends it's a setup to make them ashamed because on the third day I'm getting beside myself here this morning. See, God wants to constantly, continually, over and over again, replay the Easter weekend in your life. He wants to make the devil shame not just once 2,000 years ago. Oh, he wants to make the devil shame every day. He said, here comes another one. Here comes another one. Here, up from the grave, they keep arising. Every time he kill them, they come out again. You know, sometimes your life seems like you are in a cave. You're right. Sometimes you feel like you're in a tomb. You're right. But I got news for you. Just be cool. Everybody say, stay cool. See, when you're on ice, you can't rock. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He said, you must take up your own cross. Look at this statement here. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But if you lose your life for my purpose, you will what? You will find it. I, write this down. You ain't living until you find your life. That's a revelation to me. God is saying, you ain't really living yet because you haven't found what you was born for yet. And you ain't going to find that until you are willing to lay down all of your ideas and all of your ambitions and surrender them to him. He says, for my sake. In other words, there's a sake I sent you into the world. That's the sake that's going to be your real life. Everything else is simply an act out of Hollywood. A lot of actors in the world pretending to be happy, going to work every day on jobs they hate. Come on, talk to me. You know you ain't happy. You're frustrated, depressed. You are so unfulfilled, but you're just too busy to admit it. He said, but if you lose your life, you know, to lose your life sometime, you got to give up what everyone else thinks is good for you. I could imagine what it must have been in Peter's neighborhood when Peter told his family and all those other folks in that small village, I'm leaving. I'm giving up my fishing company. I'm turning it over to Zebedee, the old man. I'm going to follow this young Jewish guy. And I'm sure the whole town laughed at him. They told Sister Peter, Sister Peter, child, your husband's gone off. 
but they didn't know he was losing his life to find his real life oh glory hallelujah that's why today we don't remember a fisherman we remember a man standing up on the day of Pentecost full of the power of the Holy Ghost we remember the first pastor of the church that is still going after 2,000 years we remember a man whose shadow had anointing in it he found his life see many people think that Good Friday is just for Jesus the disciples had known the cross but they only knew the cross 2,000 years ago as a gruesome display of criminal sentencing that's what they knew the cross to be they saw the cross as public debt to shape public conscience that's what it was used for by the government of Rome so when Jesus started talking about cross the disciples were confused if you don't believe me let's read something that happened when he started talking about it nine months before his death Jesus began to prepare them for this cross Matthew 16 verse 21 now it, it might be helpful for, for me to do a little I'm, I'm gonna play a little mind game with you all right I want us to read first of all uh, what happened just before that remember that Jesus came uh, verse 13 and he says who do people say I am he asked them the question and Peter says what thou art the Christ the son of the living God he said, verse 16 and Jesus said blessed are you Simon by Jonah for this was not revealed to you by man but from my father in heaven and I tell you that you are what rock everybody say rock, rock. say it again rock the word Peter is from the word Petros which means rock he says for thou art rock write that down I'm gonna give you a little mind game here rock now he says Peter you are a rock and upon the rock that you spoke which is another word Petra which means boulder I will build my church which was the statement that Peter made I am the Christ he says, you are a rock, and upon what you said, I'm going to build my church. I'm the Christ. Now, watch that setup. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Verse 19. He's talking to who? Peter. He says, Peter, not only are you a rock, and what you said is a boulder that I will build on, but you seem to have a revelation. So I'm going to give you the keys or the authorities of the kingdom. Boy, Peter felt good. Now, Jesus, just a few minutes after, he's talking still. Verse 21. From that time on, he began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Underline this and he must be killed and on the third day he would rise again he began what he began to explain it to them so he starts to talk to these guys after they said he was the Christ he's okay now that you know I'm the Christ you told me I'm the Christ I agree I confirm it and I want you to know it's true it's from my father's confirmation got it good I'm the Christ now let me tell you where I'm going if you read the screenplay the Christ have to die if you read the screenplay, you guys are Jewish fellas. At age 12, you studied the book of Isaiah. You know what the Christ is supposed to do. He's supposed to die on a cross. So let me explain to you, if I am the Christ, let me explain my future to you. Watch this. He says, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. And I'll rise again the third day. Verse 22. The rock is talking. And Peter took him aside. And Peter began to rebuke his boss. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. He just told this guy, you make me proud. You a rock. Why? You just made a good confession that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, we just like that. We just so, we like boast, you know. I'll never leave you, Lord, neither forsake you. Next week, you're back on drugs. I'll follow you wherever you lead me, Lord. In the next couple of days, we can't find you. 
Just like Peter. Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then a few minutes later, I rebuke you, Jesus, in the name of God. <laughs> now Jesus said, look, uh, <laughs> to be who I am, so I could make you who you're supposed to be, there's a process. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. To be who I am, which is the Christ, to make you who you're supposed to be, which is little Christ, there's a process. Now, I want you to follow my process because you got to go through it too. Are you getting the message? The word Christ means anointed one. And the church is called the body of the anointed ones. Then he says, I'm going to bear mine. Follow me. Look at this next statement. And Peter began to rebuke him. This shall never happen to you. You know, I want you to underline that. Some people come to the Lord. Some of you are going to come to this altar today. Some of you went to the altar, gave your life to Jesus, and some pastor lied to you. Some pastor told you, it's going to be all right now. I got new news for you. It ain't going to be all right. It's going to be trouble. Don't yes, oh, get the message yet. <laughs> Jesus said, when you discover who you are in Christ, get ready for cross. Peter said, this will never happen to you. Have you heard it? People say, girl, you're a Christian, but when you was a sinner, you didn't have this many trouble. But now that you say, all hell break loose, you're supposed to say, normal, 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 normal. It's expected, it's supposed to happen. Why? Because when you are separated from the world, then you are swimming upstream. It's cross country. Say it again, cross country. When you become a Christian, you've entered cross country. It's a country full of crosses. And don't let no one tell you it shall never be so with you. If you ain't catching trouble yet, wait tomorrow. Yours is coming. Why? It's a part of becoming a leader. Peter had the spirit of many of us. This shall never happen to you. It's a girl, you're a Christian now. You ain't never have another problem. Christ is with you. Listen to me, friends. You know that ain't true. Anybody disagree with that? I disagree with that. Yes, sir. Some of you ain't had so much trouble until you got saved. Everybody say normal. normal. Say it again, normal. normal. I don't care what people say to you. Well, you know, I'm having a good day. Listen, your good day is because you understand the purpose for the trouble. <laughs> good day. <laughs> Every day the Lord has made is full of crosses. Hey boys, this is, this is the day the Lord has made. Lord has made. I, will I will rejoice. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta will to because it ain't gonna be too comfortable. Peter says, this shall never happen to you. Now look at the response of Jesus. He didn't even take a breath. Jesus turned and said to Peter. Now, you know, <laughs> this is interesting. In previous places, Jesus would say, that is the devil, or this is the devil. But when Peter said this, Jesus did not say you were under the influence. You got to read this thing. He didn't say, I think you're being manipulated by. <laughs> God, have mercy. When people try to take you off the cross, it is the devil. When people try to tell you, you ain't going to have no more problems, that's the devil setting you up. That's what makes people backslide. Because someone told them, you ain't never going to have problems. And then when problems come, they say, well, they lied. This church thing don't work. Jesus turned to Peter and says, <laughs> you, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, you ain't influenced, you are him. Are you getting the message? Yes. Good Friday is what separates you from Satan. If you have your Good Fridays, which will probably be on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays as well, Good Fridays, then Satan lost. If you stay on the cross until the, the entire plan of God is fulfilled in your life, Satan lost. But if you come down and quit before the pressure is over, Satan won. Satan talked you out of growth. 
He talked you out of development. He talked you out of becoming all you were born to be. He has literally brainwashed you to go the easy way. And believe me, friends, the easy way is not the resurrection way. Get the behind me, Satan. Now look at this next statement. You are a stumbling block to me. Okay, here's the play of the words. A few verses before, you are a rock. A few verses down, you are a stumbling block. How could a guy go from rock to stumbling block? <laughs> a stumbling block is anyone who tries to talk you out of God's test. Better write that stuff down. When God sets you up for growth, go through the cross. He said to Peter, you are a stumbling block. A few hours ago you were doing so fine, but now you're trying to talk me out of the greatest moments of my life. The cross. You do not have the mind of the things of God, but the things of men. Underline that. You know why people talk you out of what God's taking you through? Because they don't understand what God's trying to do. Are you getting this message? Everything God allows you to go through is for something God wants to accomplish in your life. And Satan doesn't want it to be successful, so he talks you out of the cross. He said, Peter, if you had understood the mind of God, here's you, what you would have known. You told me a couple of minutes ago, I'm the Christ. If you knew that was true and understood it, then you would have known that it says in the screenplay, I would die, I would be whipped, I'd be bruised, I would be a sacrifice, but then I'd rise again. If you had known all of that, you wouldn't have worried about the cross because the end of it is resurrection. Then he says, take it across, follow me now. Let me show you how to do it. When you're going through struggles, you go through it because you know the screenplay is already written. <laughs> go ahead, clap your hands just a minute. Let's, let's praise the Lord. It's <laughs> Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Paul says, for we rejoice in tribulation. Why? For we know that tribulation produces character. Not death, character. So the cross is to mold, to set you up for resurrection. So if you understand what the cross is for, then you never worry about the cross and you don't stay off it. You go through it. Why? Because there's another part of the play you already know. There's a resurrection after every cross. Lift your hands and thank God for a minute. Just praise the Lord. There's a resurrection coming. Come on, thank God for your resurrection that's coming. I don't know what you're going through, but come on, just lift your hands and thank God. There's a resurrection coming in your situation. And in your situation, God is going to bring you through. I say God's going to bring you through. God is going to bring you through this thing. You're coming out resurrected. I don't know what it is. I don't know how bad it is, but I got a good word for you. You are coming up from the grave of your situation because for every cross there is a resurrection. Praise the Lord. Shout with me a little bit. Hallelujah. God's going to bring us out of this thing. Now, if you still think that he's talking about his cross, look at verse 24. He shifts into your cross. Same conversation. And Jesus said to his who? I can't hear you. Everybody say, I'm one of them. He says to his disciples, quote, If any one of you come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me into my cross. In other words, here's my example I'm going to give you in a few days. Now you guys pick up your own when it's time. I want you to get this message because this is such a revelation to me. Good Friday is not just for Jesus. Amen. Good Friday is for every cross you are about to face since you gave your life to Jesus. Amen. And that's why Good Fridays are good. 
Oh, I feel like shouting all by myself. Good Friday is good because you know Sunday. <laughs> you could face your difficulty because you know Sunday is on the way. How could you call a dark, doomful day like Friday good Friday? Because Good Friday is a setup for Easter Sunday. But the only way Bad Friday could be Good Friday is if you know on Good Friday about Sunday. <laughs> I've come with a word from the Lord and I prophetically stated to you that God wants you to know on every Friday about Sunday. Everybody say every Sunday, every Sunday has, a Friday. has a Friday. Everybody say every, every, Friday, every Friday has a Sunday. Now, some of you may be on your Friday right now. That's the tough day. That's where they kill you and they spit on you and they beat you. Some of you are going through that right now, financially, emotionally, physically, psychologically, job-wise. You got fired. You got laid off. God's saying, this is Friday, no problem. Now, some of you, this is your Sunday. Matter of fact, ain't no hope. You're locked in. You're in a tomb. Ain't nothing happening. Every call you make, ain't nobody answering. No application coming back. This is, a, this is Saturday. But I got news for you. This may be your crucifixion day. It may be your tomb day. But I know that there's another day coming. Hallelujah. Everybody say resurrection day. When your resurrection day comes, you're going to be walking around in your nice house, driving your fine car, in your fine clothes. He said, girl, is that you? Is that really? That can't be you, child. I saw you last month. Oh, glory. You tell him, oh, yes, last month I was in my grave clothes. But this is my resurrection uniform. Come on, praise the Lord, somebody. Hallelujah! Oh, I'm preaching myself crazy today. He said, if any man will come after me, he must what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25. For whoever wants to save his life, he's repeating the thing again, shall lose it. And whoever loses his life, for the one I will give him, he will find it. For what good will it be for a man to gain all those accolades in the world and lose his very fulfillment? He said, it ain't worth it. Stay on the cross. Oh, God. You know, the cross is not only God's act of redemption or his act of salvation, but also his method of restoration to the spirit of leadership in every single human. The cross is God's method. You don't learn nothing in good times. Oh, come on. Boy, I gotta buy this tape myself. I gonna need this on Tuesday. I know, oh, Vince, I can need to hear this again. I'm telling you, you don't grow when things go in good. Have you noticed? Matter of fact, some of you are so blessed, God need to send some crosses. I'm going to say it again. I felt that one not coming. That's a prophecy. Some of y'all having it so good, you don't read your Bible no more. You're watching cable television. Why? Because you're having it too good. God's going to bring some crosses this month to make sure you get back on your knees, get back in the Bible, come back to church on time, and start ministering to Him. Why? Because you're having it too good right now. Cross don't come to kill you. Cross come to make you better. You know, I, it's, it's really intriguing. And the Holy Ghost, yes, you're right. I've seen that. When people start getting blessed, you don't see them too often anymore. They were busy to come to church. I remember when they used to catch bus and come to church. Now they got their own car. So they got things to do on Sunday morning. This ain't funny. You better watch yourself. You got money now to afford cable television. So when you didn't have cable, you used to read your Bible. Why? You don't have no TV to watch. And Zed doesn't come on until 3 o'clock, so you have to read something. 
But now you got 24 hours. You even ain't got time to read the Bible. Matter of fact, you want to substitute TV, even Christian TV, for the Word of God. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and I pray God bring some crosses into your life. Because unless we are under pressure, we don't grow. The hour of your glorification is in the hour of your greatest crisis. You are glorified in your 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 moment of crisis. The real you comes out in your moment of crisis. God ain't out to kill, he out to expose you. God ain't out to destroy, he's out to manifest you. When pressure comes, it's so God could reveal his nature. You know, Satan's, and listen to this carefully, Satan's method is profit without pain. I ain't finished yet, keep writing. Satan's method is promotion without a price. Satan's method is prosperity without productivity. Satan's method is life without labor. Satan's method is something for nothing. Satan's method is a crown without a cross. Anytime there's no cross involved, Satan's at work. I hope you hear my message today. If, it's, if it looks too easy, it is. If it looks too good to be true, you're right. Peter said, it shall never happen to you. Jesus said, you are the devil. No one will give you anything. Trust me. It costs somebody something. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Anytime it looks too easy, look for the devil. This is too easy. You know what happened the last few months here in the Bahamas? A man was giving out money, they say to pay everybody bill and some of you stood on a line for hours yeah waiting in the hot sun to cash in on someone else's labor <laughs> everybody say preach pastor <laughs> no, no, no. It, the devil's method is Jesus. Listen to this. Up front, the devil, at least the devil on us. Up front. First day of his ministry, up front. The devil says, okay, uh, I know you got three and a half years of hard work, but I tell you what, instead of spending three years and a half years, three and a half years to convince the world that you are the Christ, I have to go on a cross and die and go to hell and rose again, rise again to prove you the Christ. I tell you what, we could avoid all of that work. I can take you up on this pinnacle. At the beginning, on the pinnacle, he says, now, a lot of folks in the courtyard, thousands there, it's the big Passover feast. He said, look, if you jump from this pinnacle and land like Superman, <laughs> that was the temptation. He says, you will not dash your foot against a stone. If you jump now, they will then believe that you are Superman. You are Christ. Shortcut. 
Don't go through all that maligning and beating and spitting and all that stuff, the whip. And he said, man, you could get it over with the first day of the ministry right now. What did Jesus say? Thou shalt not tempt. Let me tell you what, when it's too good, that's a temptation. When they want to make it easy for you, that's a temptation. A temptation is always to make it easier. Nothing I got in my life came easy. I tell you, I, I am proud of everything I have, including my shoes. I tell you everything. Listen, when people come and give me a brand new suit, like this one, they give me this suit, they ain't give me this. I work my head bald for this. God just make them bring it for, for my pay. Oh, come on, somebody. You don't give me nothing. I stay up all night working hard and studying and praying and writing and reading, working hard in the same suit for three years, working hard. Then the Lord give me five suits. Don't you get jealous of me? Everybody say back pay. If you ain't doing nothing, don't expect nothing. You ain't put no, water, no bread on the water, leave the beach. The cross is the way to the crown. It's the way to your victory. Good Friday is a good Friday. And it's good not just for Jesus. He said, follow me. That means it's good for all of us. It's a good Friday. I appreciate the words of Jesus more than ever before in my life now. Take up your cross, Miles, and don't follow Satan. Satan's method is what? Profit without pain. If it ain't, if it ain't hurt to get it, it still ain't yours. You teeth that. You know, and I, I'm telling you, friends, I feel it so deep in my spirit. There's so many believers walking around, waiting for folks to bless them, just kind of walking around. They don't want to just walking all over the place, just visiting people. You better stop. <laughs> but the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he should starve to death. He shouldn't even eat. Why? That's the way of the devil. Jesus said it himself. He says, you cannot reap where you didn't sow. Don't reap where another man sowed. <laughs> the cross is a part of discipleship. True leaders are formed in the womb of the cross. I'm going to say it again. True leaders are formed in the womb of the cross. The cross revealed that Peter's confession was only cheap talk. That's why Peter picked and he fell apart when the test came. Thou art the Christ. Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. He said, no, don't go to the cross. He said, no, look, you, that talk you just gave is nothing but cheap talk. You tell me how great I am, and then you tell me I ain't powerful enough to go through that little test. How many of you say, I am a king's kid? My God is greater than everything. Crazy as him, he is in the world. I mean, you quote all these scriptures, and then test comes. I bind you, devil. I loose you, devil. There was, now, which one you want, bind or loose? Uh, you know, I'm on assignment here. I, <laughs> I came to refine your fate. Now, you want me to leave? The, let me just close with some thoughts on the cross. I want you to, to write these down. Remember these some very interesting things about the cross. You know, the cross in our day has become the most diluted symbol of the church. Very shallow. Today, it's sported as a cheap piece of jewelry around your neck. The cross is now earrings. Or it is now displayed as an expensive piece of architecture in some church building. Look at the cross. It's a chain around your neck on your chest now. It, 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 it's, it's, it's for beauty. Because we don't understand it. The Peter and John and the thousands of others who died over the years for the sake of this cross to casually, if they were to wear a crucifix earring or a chain, that would be as maniacal as someone today flashing a new electric chair as a pendant. Or maybe a necklace donning a 14-carat gas chamber. 
Isn't that what it would be? Yes. In the day of Peter, that was capital punishment. So you walk around with a hangman's noose as a piece of jewelry. Or the electric chair on a chain saying, this is my jewelry. That's how it feels to Peter looking at us from heaven today with these nice little golden chains in our ears and on our chest and on our bracelet. And Peter's saying, them folks don't understand what that is. That's not jewelry. That's death. That's test. That's tribulation. Can you imagine the absurdity of seeing a large, larger than life hangman noose constructed on the roof of a church all lit up in the night from the highway? That's how the cross looks to Peter and James today. They see capital punishment being paraded on our church buildings. And they say the 20th century church still ain't got the message. Now, I'm not suggesting that we purge the cross. I'm not suggesting that you throw away your jewelry and get rid of your bracelets. But I only want to remind you that the truth must be told about what that symbol may, really means. And it, you, should, you should remember, matter of fact, when you're going through your difficult times, you take the chain off and kiss it. Then you understand what it's for. When things are falling apart and everything, it began to collapse. You take your earring off and kiss it and say, I understand what this is. It's not decoration. It's motivation for you to keep moving through your trials. The cross stands for a very deep sacrifice. It was the greatest lesson of Jesus, and he died teaching it. Nothing can tutor you through life like the moments of silence on the cross. Jesus was the master teacher and the cross was his classroom and his greatest lesson. Jesus knew without a living portrayal of endurance and discipline and sacrifice and trust, his disciples would last 10 steps out of the upper room. He knew that if he didn't show them how to handle difficulty himself and paraded himself, they couldn't handle 10 days out of Jerusalem. He had to show them that life is filled with difficulties, but in the midst of that, you just remain silent and show life that you could handle this. I say hallelujah to everybody. God is saying no matter what you're going through, don't start complaining and getting mad at God and staying away from church and cussing all the Christians and rebuking everybody. God says, show them how strong you are. When they spit on you, just watch it fall. When they curse you, you don't answer. When they say you'll never make it, you just smile and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When they put a nail in your wrist and it kills the nerve that caused more pain, and you say to them, it's okay. This is part of growing up. When they put their thorns through your head and they say you're crazy and you are nothing, you'll never make it. He said, just look at them and say nothing. Why? Because you are bigger than all of them. That's what the cross is supposed to show. He says, follow me. The cross that Jesus was on, he forged a new accountability between word and deed. He was saying, no longer could you be a phony Pharisee or a lukewarm disciple that lives only by confession. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I feel the Holy Ghost. God said, let's prove that. Ain't no longer going to be no phony believer walking around. I am more, in a, my, my father's rich in house and land. God said, okay, let me see if you can handle poverty. Amen. Just a little taste of it. To see if you believe it when you ain't got nothing. Amen. No longer can you be a phony Pharisee. The cross forever settled the issue that everything you say must be tested. He said he is the lamb. He said he is the atoning sacrifice. And then the moment came when he had to prove it. And you got to keep your mouth shut when you're proving it. You can't complain and say, God, why me? Why did you bring me through this, O oh Lord? Why did I come to this, O oh Lord? God said, but you told me that this is what you are. I'm just testing to see if it's true. When Peter told Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll stay with you forever. Jesus says, oh, no, Peter. You just invited a test. Satan's going to come and sift you. Why? You just open your mouth. 
Write this down. The cross is attracted by confession. When you confess, Jesus is my Lord, that was the day that you attracted every single cross Satan could throw. Because he wants to make himself Lord of your life. There is no doubt that the cost of true leadership is the cross. What is the cross that he calls us to bear? It is the price of standing against the tide. The cross is adhering to higher standards when everybody is living according to low ones. The cross is obedience to a higher authority even at the point of violation of your own life. The cross is allegiance to a greater master so that you're not mastered by other people in other situations. The cross is following a path of a higher life. The cross is the price of rejection and hatred by others and abuse and slander and pressure and misunderstanding and difficulty, even perhaps death. That's the cross. The cross is paying the price to please God at any cost. The cross is walking away from a life that was full of destruction so you can follow a rough path of purity. The cross is leaving a broad road where everybody is going and joining a narrow street where only few can be found. The cross is separating yourself from the gang and becoming a one person with your own destiny. The cross is tough. The cross is proof of the pudding. The cross is saying to God, I am your disciple. The power of his silence is the motivation that keeps me going. To be a true leader, you must fix your eyes on the body language of Calvary. You must fix your eyes and your ears on the quiet lamb. To be successful in life, you must be carefully listening to the words that he did not say. This is the power of the cross. Today, I want to invite every single one of us here today and listening to this tape and watching this video on television. I want to invite you to pause to remember for a moment and then listen to the greatest silent sermon ever preached. Listen to him for five hours and 59 minutes. He was saying, this is how you handle your problems. Listen to the one that took place the Friday before the Sunday. The sermon that was so quiet that it was the most important. The sermon that lasted six hours without a word. The one that is easy to memorize but difficult to emulate. What a sermon. The sermon that was lived, not spoken, by a silent lamb. The purpose of his death was to provide the atonement for the forgiveness of all of us. To give us the blood to cleanse our sins. To give us the debt to satisfy the wages of sin. That's why he had to go to Calvary. To shed his blood for the purification. To make mankind righteous again. And to make us holy again. So that we could once again receive the Holy Spirit. Which is the key to the Spirit of leadership that restores us to our purpose which is the life that he has for us and to give us once again the dominion spirit. Calvary is the key to receiving the Holy Spirit. This is why it is said in Philippians 2.5 let the same mind that means attitude that was in him, Christ be also in you that being found in the form of a man he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death on the cross. And because of that, listen to the message here, because he went through the cross, God gave him a name. That's the message. The cross qualified him for a different reputation. What name? God exalted him, it says, after the cross and gave him a name after the cross that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will have to respect and bow. I learned from this statement that you don't deserve respect until you got some scars. 
Come on, he said, follow me, he says. He says, you want to have a good reputation? Go through some difficulties and come out smiling. There is no name without a cross. Write that down, please. There is no true reputation without a cross. 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 I don't care what people think about you. There's no true reputation without a cross. Have a good flight. God bless you. Every reputation, write this down, without a cross is a fake. Every reputation without a cross is a fake. And every reputation without a cross will be tested by a cross. Every reputation without a cross will be tested by a cross. <clears throat> That's why you can only fake people for so long. And life will come and get you. You could, you could pretend for a long time. But life has a way of exposing your false reputation. Great people are people full of scars. People without history don't trust them. <laughs> no reputation is made without the cross. Let God give you a name. Not society. Let God give you a name. Don't let the newspapers do it. Let God give you a name. Don't let the constituency vote for you. Let tribulation qualify you for a title. Don't walk around and let people like you because you look cute. Don't let your handsome figure and your open personality and your likable spirit allow people to make you believe that you are reputable. Life gonna slap you down. You gonna go through so much hell because life don't respect nobody until life finished proven you deserve it. If you don't go through a cross, God won't give you a name. Let's pray.